Hello and welcome to the group room where we're at the 34th annual CTRC AACR San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium. So happy to be joined again by Dr. Julie Graylo, Professor, Medical Oncology, the Department of Medicine in the Division of Oncology. Uh, Dr. Graylo is the Director of Breast Medical Oncology and a member of the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center Clinical Research Division. And we get together every year at this time, and you always give us such great information and updates. And this time, we're going to talk a bit about new treatment options for postmenopausal women and metastatic breast cancer and an endocrine and bisphosphonates update and recommendations. All right. Well, thanks so much for having me back again, Selma. This is always a, a highlight of my San Antonio uh, breast cancer symposium experience. So we had a lot of exciting data at this meeting, and um, some that's really practice changing. Uh, some years we don't go back to the clinic again and change much, but this year I think we've got some changes. So the, the first abstract I, I thought it would be fun to mention is uh, called the SWOG SO226 trial. So this is looking at um, metastatic patients who have estrogen receptor positive breast cancer and what's the best way to treat them. In this trial, uh, we took um, about 700 women with newly diagnosed uh, metastatic disease that was estrogen receptor positive, and everybody got an aromatase inhibitor, you know, which is one of the, the standard drugs uh, in treating ER positive breast cancer. But we randomized half to get in combination fulvestrant or Fazlodex, which is another anti-estrogen treatment. Laboratory data had suggested that maybe the two together would be better than either alone. And an important part of this trial is that in the women who got only the arimidex or anastrozole, the aromatase inhibitor, at the time that their tumor progressed, we um, actually strongly encouraged them to transition to the fulvestrant or Fazlodex therapy. We even provide a drug to encourage the, the physician and the patient to do that. So it's really more of a combination versus sequential therapy. That's really key. We've seen a lot of combination therapies that seem better, but we don't actually know if you need to give those drugs in combination, which is frequently more toxic, or if they could just be given sequentially. So, the cut to the chase. The result was that the combination was better in terms of what we call disease-free survival, um, you know, progression-free survival, the time that the patients went without the disease progression progressing, and also an overall survival. So women in the combination lived longer statistically. And so we took that result, which was maybe a little surprising to us, um, and said, is there a population that seems to be doing better um, so that we don't have to give everybody combination up front, um, but we could pick out who benefits most? Turns out it's the women who hadn't had prior tamoxifen therapy. Uh, women who really had had no prior anti-estrogen therapy seemed to do better from kind of this combination blast of estrogen-targeted therapy versus giving them in sequence. So, um, you know, in this day and age, a lot of women who relapse with metastatic ER-positive breast cancer, they've already had prior endocrine therapy. So I'm not sure it's so applicable to all of those women, but the group of women who have ER-positive disease that have never before seen endocrine therapy, which is the group we think this combination benefits most, that's all of the women with early-stage breast cancer who have never been treated. So we're now going to design a trial looking at this combination in early-stage breast cancer to see if we can reduce deaths and recurrences from the combination. Pretty exciting. Very exciting. And also hearing words like practice changing, and I've been hearing this a lot. Absolutely. This meeting had a lot of exciting practice changing data. Now, what about the bisphosphonates and the, the use of uh, the bone-targeted agents in potentially reducing recurrences in early-stage breast cancer? There were actually four, count them four, uh, oral presentations on this topic. Two of them were positive and two of them were negative. So we really haven't resolved the question of um, how many women, which women should be getting bisphosphonates to help reduce breast cancer recurrence. But I think we did get some hints um, from these studies. So we saw an update of the ABCSG12, the Austrian uh, study of premenopausal ER-positive breast cancer patients that not only showed 
um, reduced recurrences, which we had seen previously, but now for the first time, reduction in deaths by adding zoledronic acid, Zometa, every six months for three years. So six doses of Zometa over three years in this group of patients and the Zometa reduced deaths now. Surprise to actually really see it have that kind of strong impact. Additionally, we saw an update of a trial we called the ZOFAST trial. Now, instead of the Austrian trial, this is postmenopausal women. About half of them got chemo. They're all estrogen receptor positive, and they're all starting an aromatase inhibitor for early stage breast cancer. And they were also randomized to get zoledronic acid every six months or not. And that now has shown reduced recurrences, don't see reduced deaths yet in that study, but there's a trend toward a reduction in deaths in that study. The good news is in both of these studies, the recurrence rate and the death rates are really low. Great news for our early stage patients. So all of that positive data is in ER positive patients, and a lot of them hadn't gotten chemo. They're just getting endocrine therapy where we're seeing the benefit. Then we saw the NSABP B34 trial of an oral bisphosphonate, clodronate, which was taken daily in um, the study for three years. And that trial was overall negative. Um, when they tried to see could there be a positive group, um, it's probably the older patients. They did a cut point of 50 or younger, 50 or older, maybe some hints that the women 50 or older were benefiting. Remember, a clodronate trial, the B34 trial, was ER positive or ER negative. A lot of them got chemo pre- and post-menopausal. And then the last of the four bisphosphonate trials is called the GAIN trial. It was a German trial where everybody got really intensive anthracycline taxane chemo, and part of the question was different chemo, but it was all aggressive chemo. And then they were randomized to get a bandronate, an oral bisphosphonate given daily or not. And that trial was also flat out negative, um, but again, it was a mix of ER positive, ER negative. Everybody got aggressive chemo. It was a mix of premenopausal, postmenopausal. So it doesn't mean all women should be getting bisphosphonates, but I do believe I'm taking home from this that in the ER positive population, especially those who I'm not giving an, uh, chemotherapy to, I'm going to be more inclined to give a bisphosphonate, not just to help preserve the bone density and reduce fractures, but to reduce recurrences as well. In the research setting, when you get n a negative results, what then happens to the drug and the research? Right now, with clodronate and abandronate at this dose, we're not going to see these drugs approved for reducing um, bone metastases in early stage breast cancer. You just can't take a negative trial, even if some women might be benefiting and convert it into a positive trial. The interesting thing is, Selma, that we've got an ongoing trial that actually I'm the lead investigator on. We call the SWOG SO307 trial. It's comparing the zoledronic acid which is the drug that to date we've really seen some positive data for. It's comparing it with the abandronate at this daily dose and clodronate at this daily dose. And um, this trial has met accrual a couple of years ago, and it'll be a few years before we analyze it. But this is a 6,000 person trial, and we're going to have enough data to evaluate. We're revising our statistics to evaluate the truly postmenopausal from the premenopausal, and we'll have enough patients in this huge trial to try to better sort out. Is one drug better than another, and in which population? So I don't think the clodronate, which by the way, an earlier study from 10 years ago was positive in this setting, so that's a little confusing as well. And I don't think clodronate is dead. I don't think that the oral abandronate is dead. I just think that it wasn't tested in a population that was highly likely to benefit. I'm thinking that all that chemo masked the benefit of the bisphosphonate, which is fine, but I would prefer not to give chemo and to give the bisphosphonate than vice versa. So we've got to explore that more. What's the update with um, jaw issues? Yeah, the osteonecrosis of the jaw. So we know that when we give 
sildronic acid monthly, like we do when we're treating patients with bone meds, that there's probably in breast cancer on the order of a 1 to 2 percent incidence over a long period of time of getting monthly sildronic acid. In these trials that were reported uh, at this meeting, the rate was reassuringly incredibly low. Some of the trials had no ONJ. Um, one of the trials, as I recall, had two or three cases, but out of, you know, hundreds of women. So when we're giving every six months oledronic acid, when we're giving these oral bisphosphonates, we're really not seeing any substantial incidence of ONJ. It's when we give more intensive dosing for treating bone mets that we're seeing some osteonecrosis of the jaw. Thank you, Dr. Graylow. In, in, in closing, um, I don't know if there's a comment that you have as to what you think is happening next. Uh, you've mentioned where the research is still pending. And also, I know you're heavily involved in the physical component of exercise and uh, the physical well-being of breast cancer patients. And I couldn't help noticing the obesity studies, the question of diabetes, the uh, nutritional studies, uh, starch intake, carbohydrates. Do you want to comment on any of those? Well, I guess I would just summarize all of that by saying we're, we're finally taking a look at some of these things, the impact of physical activity and maintaining a good body weight and nutrition and mind-body as well on outcome. Um, a lot of women, when they undergo treatment for breast cancer, feel that it's so passive. You know, they're just, the treatments are being done to them. And so I really try to encourage patients to take control of the things you can take control of and you know there are some positive things you can do short of drug therapy radiation you know chemotherapy and all and that's try to live a healthy lifestyle both in terms of physical as well as emotional and it really will give you benefit in a lot of ways thank you for always making time I know you're super busy dr. Julie Graylow professor of medical oncology in the Department of Medicine in the Division of Oncology Dr. Graylow is the Director of Breast Medical Oncology and a member of the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center Clinical Research Division. Thanks, Dr. Graylow. Thanks, Alma.